Welcome to the Every Voice Now podcast, where we bring voices of color into the spotlight. In every episode, you'll hear stories of our authors of color, how God led them to write their books, and the challenges they had to overcome along the way. Hey everyone, it's Paloma Lee here, and I have the honor of introducing today's guest. Mekdes Hadis is the founder and executive coach of Just Missions, an online community that elevates diaspora voices and equips Western allies to become mutual partners for the work of the gospel. She's also the project director of the Racial Justice and Reconciliation Collaborative for the National Association of Evangelicals. Mekdes is the author of the IVP title, A Just Mission, Laying Down Power and Embracing Mutuality. This book provides a post-colonial critique of Western missions, and it challenges a lot of the practices and ingrained beliefs towards mission that have become the norm in America and the West. Mekdes has a way of exhorting the church with so much grace and so much truth, truth that may be hard to hear, but I hope that as you hear her story and the way she was led to write A Just Mission, you'll find yourself reflecting and perhaps wrestling a bit with ideas that lead to love of God and love of neighbor in a deeper, fuller way. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Mekdes Hadis. We are excited to welcome Mekdes Hadis to the Every Voice Now podcast today. Thank you for joining us on this episode. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. For those who don't know your full background, could you tell us about your ethnic background and throughout your childhood and teenage years, what are some key moments along that ethnic identity journey that stand out to you? Yeah, so I grew up in Ethiopia. I am uh, from Ethiopia. Ethiopia is such a diverse country that I grew up with a lot of like tribal languages being spoken around me. I am a speaker of Amharic, which is one of the main languages of Ethiopia. I grew up in a culture that is oral. So even from childhood, when we're taught our alphabets, uh, like the Ethiopian, the Amharic alphabet, we are taught through not writing, but orally repeating after our elders. So there was a lot of listening to stories and repeating after elders. And then the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, which is really kind of the a place that holds a lot of Ethiopian history, has shaped how we view the world and how our culture has been identified as one that is really theologically like has a lot of depth and meaning. So I grew up really around phrases like, for example, when you say good morning in Ethiopia, the response is not good morning back to you, but it is which means praise be to God. That's how you respond to good morning. So there's like this theology built into that language and our culture that I grew up around. I describe my childhood as a time of just so much joy and laughter and community. So yeah, and my grandparents used to live in the further out of the Addis where I grew up, which is the capital city. They used to live in Hararge, which is a region where we would go visit for the summer. And so, and that side of the country is predominantly Muslim and practices a more Arabic culture because of the, where it is, it's in the eastern side of Ethiopia. And so there is a beautiful culture that I've been immersed in as well. The Adere tribe lives in that and they're very, they speak Arabic and things like that. So just a lot of diversity and beauty. So yeah, I would describe my childhood as just so much fun and beautiful, lots of learning. And I think that's what kind of made me, and I know we'll get into it later, but when I moved to the U.S., it was such a shock because not only there was this one dominant culture, but it's also demanding that you become like it. And it was such like an intrusive experience that I rejected. And so I think the contrast between how I grew up and then how I experienced life 
as an adult is that there was this, you know, curiosity to learn new cultures and new languages and try some different food and commune with people even from other religions. And then I come to the U.S. and there's just this demand that I must be like the majority. Otherwise, there is a punishment almost to refusing, confirming to the, the majority. Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by your, you mentioned your parents brief, or throughout your book, actually. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned that your father was an investment banker and he focused on development and aid. What was that experience watching him work, doing that work, getting both this backstage view into issues in your country, but also a global perspective? Yeah. I mean, my dad loved, um, you know, traveling and then serving his community through the work that he did. He worked with farmers and small business owners, as well as large investors. And he just navigated both worlds so beautifully, you know, he saw so much potential in the Ethiopia that we know, you know, and saw always, always looking for ways to develop what we had and not import and kind of westernize our community. So I really learned from him this way of looking at who we were and how God made our culture to be the most beautiful expression of, you know, the beauty of God. And my role is being figuring out how to amplify that and give a space for our people who may not have opportunities, you know, to carry out their gifts in the way that the world may recognize or see, like to find ways for them to do that. So I really learned from my dad what it means to advocate and amplify the voices or the opportunities for people who may be seen as less than. You also mentioned your mom too in the book and just that her faith was such a, well, let me let you share about it. What was your mom's influence on you? Yeah, my mom is such a devoted follower of Christ. And so from childhood, I saw her following God faithfully and so beautifully she is one of those quite spirited, kind, gentle person that does not say anything wrong, honestly. Just, you know, she is the image of Christ that the Lord has gifted me in, you know, to see and kind of imitate my life after. So she's such a gift. But even uh, when I was little, like, let's say I wake up and have a nightmare, she would come and pray over me. One of the, you know, scriptures that she loved to pray over me was Psalm 23. I I had actually a season where I would have these terrifying dreams and she would just come and sit and read scripture over me and pray over me and kind of made me feel safe. And because of how she displayed the Lord in her walk and in my life, I always knew that he was there and that he cared deeply for me and that he was for me. Like I never had a season in my life where I was like, is God good? Because she just did such a good job of showing me that he is good and he is kind and he is forgiving. And yeah, I I don't know if I wrote this in the book, but I remember like every morning I wake up to my mom, like her hand over my forehead praying for me. You know, there's four of us in my siblings and I, and she would pray for each of us by name every morning. And that's how she woke us up. It's not like rise and shine and open the window. It's more of, you know, lay her hand over our our head and pray for us. So she is such an amazing, beautiful soul who loves the Lord and doesn't push her way. Again, like what I learned from my mom was that evangelism is not something that you do that but it's something that you become like you become like Christ and you become an aroma of Christ so that others will see him and hear him through you and then you know follow him because they cannot deny what they were able to experience through your life and that was my mom that is my mom and you know she I as I say in the book she was the missionary we needed in our home and she is to so many right now yeah Wow, that kind of made me tear up a little bit, like mm-hmm. imagining her waking you up with prayer. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. that's amazing. That sounds like two incredible 
like different and both so incredible people to raise you and have influenced your life. So thanks for sharing. Yeah, absolutely. Were there any hints when you were a child that you would write a book in the future? You know, I've always loved to write. I don't know if I ever thought of myself as an author, but I knew that I would always write, you know, (laughs) because I started writing early on. I would just journal my thoughts throughout the day, what happened. There was never a time that I wasn't writing. Like I would write in the cap, like if I'm having coffee with friends and a thought pops into my head, I would just pull out like a napkin and write, write it. And then I go home and rewrite it in my journal. So it's always been a part of my life, but it's been a part of my, like me processing my thoughts and not necessarily me thinking the world needs to know what I'm thinking or hearing. So it's always been a way for me to kind of be free, you know, and just explore what I see in the world. Mm -hmm. Do you still have any of those like journals or notes that oh, yeah. I used to write in. <laughs> I have a ton of them. I have a bunch at home back home in Ethiopia where that my mom has saved from childhood. And sometimes we read them and just crack up. But I have a <laughs> bunch here too. You know, there's a lot of journals. <laughs> <laughs> I love that though, because you can go back to that. It's almost like you're yeah. transported instantly to that part of your life again. Exactly. See the ways that you've changed and those are really special. I think they are. Yes, <laughs> it is. So in that same time of life, before you came to the U.S., at what point did you realize vocational ministry is something that has to be a part of my life? I, mm-hmm. I need to go and study over here. What were kind of some of the, mo- the moments or a key moment mm-hmm. where you realized that? Yeah. So I actually realized that before I came to the U.S. So I rededicated my life to the Lord. And I always say rededicated because I was kind of I've always, you know, I grew up in the church, but it was never like a serious thing where I thought, okay, this is something I'm going to pursue as I loved God, but I was just kind of (laughs) chilling. But at 16, I made the decision. I was like, no, I really want to pursue God the way my mom is pursuing him. And so it was a conscious decision to go through. We had a six month discipleship class that you had to go through to get baptized. And really, when you make the decision to follow Jesus, that's the first step in the Ethiopian church, like Ethiopian evangelical church that you're asked to take. And so I did that at 16. And then I got baptized. And after that, I never looked back. My life had just transformed in such an amazing way. I experienced the power of the Spirit. I just felt like this is where God is calling me, and I want to tell the world about Him. I want to tell all my friends about Him. I want to learn the Bible so I can teach other people about who God is. And God was just showing up in my life in such amazing ways. And so at 16, I did sense a call to full-time ministry I just couldn't see anything for my life besides that. And then I went to college for about a year, actually, in Ethiopia. And that's when it became very, very clear that that was not the place for me because there was something God was doing in my heart and whatever I was doing there was not matching up to it. And from what I saw there, you either have to be a pastor or that's it. And I wasn't, I didn't necessarily feel called to become a pastor. I just knew that I needed to serve the Lord. And so when the Lord opened the door for me to come to the States and study, I made sure that I looked for a school that was Christian so that I could learn the Bible. And I was really passionate about just learning how to study the Bible. That was a tool that was not given to me in my discipleship journey, just the way that they taught us scripture. It was Again, it was very oral culture. So there's a lot of theology you hear, but we were not taught to like study it and kind of grasp it for ourselves. So that was a thirst of my heart. So I wanted to go to a Christian school and I wanted to study God's word. But I will say there was a time, I think I was about 17 or so, right before I went to college in Ethiopia. One day, like at a Sunday service, the preacher like after he preached a sermon on actually Joseph's story, 
the title was called Tell Me Your Dream. And I remember like when that sermon was being preached, I was like bawling my eyes out the whole like hour. Like I was just crying. I couldn't look at the preacher. I just had my face down, just crying and crying and crying. And I knew somehow that story was for me, like God was calling me to something big, but also something that was going to be costly. And so after he was done, one of the pastors got up and said, I just feel the Holy Spirit leading me to pray for the congregation. And then we were praying. And then all of a sudden, I hear him say, you young girl, come over. I want to pray for you. And I was like, I was not even looking up because I'm like, what the heck is happening? And I was sitting with some of my friends and they were all like, like this, poking me like to get up. They're like, get up and that's for you. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not going. (laughs) And he like looks at me and he's like, you, you young girl, come here. I want to pray for you. I feel led to pray for you. And I was like trembling going up there. I was literally, I was 16 or 17. Like I had no idea. But I remember him specifically saying that you're going to lead in a global context. And then he also prayed that God has put like this message in me that the world needs to hear. And I remember thinking, that's so exciting, but I don't know. (laughs) Like, I mean, I believed God, but I was like, this is so far from where I am right now, you know? And yeah, it was right after that that I went to, you know, the college in Ethiopia and became super restless with everything that was going on. I was like, no, the Lord has like singled me out for ministry. I know that he separate, like he set me apart to do his work and I have no idea what it is, but I need to follow him. And that journey is what brought me to the States. I was literally just following, like, where is that thing that you told me I'm supposed to do and ended up here? (laughs) That's incredible. That is a crazy experience to have. And also, I think just that's so encouraging both to me and I think also to the people who will be listening of when God calls you in that way and you're feeling overwhelmed and so underprepared Mm -hmm. and and how you described it. It's so far away from where I'm at right now. Yeah, it's that is so amazing just to see Mm -hmm. what God can do. Yeah, it was just not in my context. like. What I'm doing right now, you know, I've, there was nobody around me who came from my background that I ever saw, you know. So it was like so hard to imagine and dream. All I had was his word to follow, you know. So, yeah. Which took you into a complete step into the unknown. Can you tell us about what that experience was like of coming to the U.S. and in the book, you mention your experience as this like beautiful spiritual awakening and mm-hmm. also a really painful cultural awakening. So could you describe yeah. what that was like? Yeah. So I came and I actually went to a community college for a year because my aunt was the one who uh, sponsored me and I came to stay with her until I found a school that I wanted to go to. So I got a full ride scholarship to Liberty University and it was it's, I think it still is one of the largest Christian universities. I was super excited to be there. And I went and I remember like my first experience was just how dedicated a bunch of kids my age were to the Lord. And again, not something I had experienced before. It was such a beautiful representation of who God is and just a collective worship of God with people my age who are also following him want to figure out ways to serve him for the rest of their lives. So it was such a beautiful, surreal experience. And obviously I I came as an international student. And so there was a lot of culture that I had to learn. Although I spoke English just the way that I am speaking it right now to you. I knew American culture very well. I watched all the shows that people my age were watching. I just had great access while I was back in Ethiopia. My dad made sure that we were exposed to Western culture and that we spoke the language and all of that stuff. And so I was not necessarily learning the language, but I was learning culture and that's different. And so 
I gave it about a year or so until I kind of got acclimated to how people my age act and think in this country and in this school. So during that time, I focused on really just learning about God. That was the purpose I came was to study the Bible specifically. I took courses like theology and Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, all of that stuff. And I I remember like kids would just fall asleep in the classroom and I was like the one taking notes like crazy and raising hands. I have a friend that still laughs at that. She's like, I remember you being the one that would raise their hand while everybody's like sleeping. But I just came from a place that didn't happen. And so I was like, wow, like everything in this college is geared towards helping me think about God and kind of helping me shape my worldview and how, you know, I serve God and others. But with my interpersonal relationships, you know, with friendships, I just kept seeing that the people that were interested in forming a relationship with me were those that were either most of the international students, anybody in the minority group, you know, Black students, or just some really unique white kids that were curious about culture. But for the majority that just came right out of co- you know high school and came and is like doing their thing, they weren't necessarily interested in kind of getting to know me. And I was like, what's going on? It seemed like there's a click and I don't know what that click is about. So I didn't understand it. But the more I got used to the culture, I started seeing that, oh, they see me as other. Like if I'm at a party and we're hanging out instead of like, you know, at a random person's house, they would be like, hey, like you're Mektes. Oh, you're from Ethiopia. Cool. So do you guys have cars there? Like just randomly, you know, but I, the way I described it when I was there was I always feel like an outsider. Like I always feel like a foreigner and I know I am, but at some point I need to start this needs to become my new home and I need to start becoming like one of the people that this community embraces and welcomes. But there was no space for someone like me. It's either I was treated as a receiver, which is like, oh, do you guys have cars and do you whatever? Like, have you seen a lion? Or I went to a mission trip to Ethiopia. That was like the one that I got all the time was, oh, you know, I went to this remote area. They say the name I've never heard of before. And then they would say, we ate food that we sat on the mud and did this and that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know what you're, I don't know what they're talking about. They may have had that experience, but it was just so far removed from my experience that I was like, I can't help you. That's not a conversation I can engage with. Or it was that they didn't know what, like either way, they didn't know how to get closer to me. So they pushed me further and further away from their community. And it was not like a conscious thing they did. It was just subconsciously, that's what over came out of them. So it became a really difficult experience when I started wanting to have more friends or just be a part of the community and become part of the solution for whatever was happening in that space instead of always being told, wait, you're from the outside. So we don't know what to do with you. This stuff doesn't involve you. So that was such a painful experience for me personally. Yeah, what I'm hearing in some of those stories is kind of this dissonance. And I'm just wondering, was there a moment where maybe it moved from a subconscious? Mm -hmm. This is weird to really starting to think about those things a lot more in terms of of Western mission and the way that you experienced it through college or maybe right afterwards? Yeah, I think there are a couple of ways. One of them was, I remember they did send, you know, mission trips, like spring break, I think was the time that students went on a mission trip. And there was this one year that they were sending a team to Ethiopia. And by that time, I was actually a part of student leadership. I quickly became part of, you know, this student leadership team. I was an RA for two years. And so I was known, you know, as one of the student leaders and people knew that I was from Ethiopia. But I remember that they were recruiting people to go and nobody reached out to me either to go as part of the team or to train the team. 
although I was part of the student leadership team. And so I remember thinking that was so weird at the time, but also just that, I don't know. I mean, they're not trying to intentionally be disrespectful, but that was a very disrespectful experience for me where people are going to my country. They're going to go try and speak my language and they are going to go eat my food, but they're not interested in involving somebody they consider a partner in ministry, you know? So that oversight was something that I was like, Ooh, this is weird, you know, and very disrespectful and kind of like, wow, I can't believe I'm that invisible. (laughs) You know, like it just, I didn't fit in the way that they saw the mission movement, like the diaspora, you know, the people that are here in the U S are none of their business. Their business was somewhere far away in Ethiopia. And they just wanted to do their activities and come back and live their regular life. So that was one of the defining moments, I think. I cannot imagine what that would have been like. And then they'll come and show videos, you know, of your people, and then they'll tell your story for you. They'll tell their stories for them. And to sit in that crowd and kind of allow somebody to redefine my history or redefine my people's stories, it's honestly a dehumanizing yeah. even though at the time I didn't experience it as that I just was confused and kind of like puzzled but when I look back and think about it I'm like wow that was so wrong on so many levels you know yeah yeah I'm curious kind of continuing on your journey after college and I don't know how far after college this was but could you describe your move to Charlotte and what was going on at that time. And there's this point you realize as a, as an awakening yes. going on at that time. Could you share more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So right out of uh, college, I, I lived in the DC area for about eight, nine years. And then after my husband and I got married, we moved to the Charlotte area. And so we move here. And at that time is when uh, Keith uh, Lamont was shot by a cop literally the week that we were moving. And there was just so much fear and terror in how that situation was handled. And I remember hearing the news and them saying like, rioters in Charlotte are rioting and destroying property, blah, blah, blah. And I remember thinking, wait, somebody from their community was shot wrongfully And these people are mourners, like they're literally out on the street crying out for justice. But the way that the message was getting to us was there's violence, rioting, and then fear, like hide in your homes. Instead of engaging the conversation and saying, what happened? How can we like heal our city? And I was just coming on staff at a church here and What actually attracted me to that church at that time was they were going through the racial history of the United States and how it's impacted the Black community. And I was like, okay, they're trying to engage the conversation. Like, I can be here. But for the most part, I just saw this animosity between how the the news was communicating, whether it's like network news or just in our community, how people were talking about what was happening. And I was like, wow, there's no mercy or curiosity or empathy to what's happening. People just really want to hide. And it exposed to me the need of the city that I was coming into. And that was that the point where it hit me like I had done some work with Be the Bridge, learning my racial identity as an immigrant. It's really difficult to get that because you don't have the historical context. I came from Ethiopia with my history. And so coming here and kind of experiencing this otherness pushed me into exploring more of where is this otherness coming from. And I was starting to learn that, oh, being Black has something to do with it. The way people see me is not as Mekdes, the Ethiopian. They see first a Black woman. They don't see, oh, a Christian woman that loves Jesus. They see a black woman who's also an immigrant, and then maybe Jesus is somewhere there. But there's such a a way that a biased view of people of color that 
prevents people from seeing us equals or as human or, or as a brother and sister in Christ. And so I was starting to get to put the pieces together, but I felt like when that happens in my own city, I was like, oh my gosh, these are my people. These are the people that I have to connect with and work with and kind of because I saw the division and I was like, nobody's going to claim me. Only my people are the ones that I can have community with. So that was an awakening, just knowing that my husband was, you know, out and about. I don't know how people are going to perceive him if he was going to be attacked by an officer or whatever it may be. I was like, this is scary. It was a very scary time for a lot of Black moms, especially just worrying about their kids. And and so, yeah, that was one of those moments that everything kind of came together. And I think I kind of settled in my identity as a Black woman in America. Before we get back to today's episode, I want to let you know about an amazing free resource that allows you to dive into God's Word with the time of prayer every day. Get in the Word with Truth's Table is a daily podcast narrated by the popular hosts of the show, Truth's Table, Dr. Christina Edmondson and Akemeni Uwan. The podcast goes through the Bible in one year through daily readings of the Old and New Testaments, and each day ends with inspiring and heartfelt prayers from Christina and Akemeni. So check out Get in the Word with Truth's Table wherever you get your podcasts. And now, back to today's conversation. You're listening to the Every Voice Now podcast, and I'm Paloma Lee. Today, we're talking with Mekdes Hadis, author of the IVP book, A Just Mission. Mekdes, as you processed all these experiences in college, then living in Charlotte, what was the moment you realized you needed to write the book and put these thoughts into writing? Yeah, so that was a process. You know, as I mentioned, I always love to write. And then the more I became awakened to this racial injustice and how it's connected to the evangelical faith, I started writing about it in my blog, just kind of like to, again, as I mentioned earlier, I always write to kind of process and that's how I grow. And so I started writing, Lord, if I know you before all of this, I think the Lord that I knew God before coming to America, because I'm like, if I was introduced to him in this mess, I would have walked away from the church and I don't blame anybody that does. But because I knew God and I had this intimate story and experience with him in a different context, I needed to make sense of what was happening in this context. And I knew him to be mighty over all things. And I knew he would give me answers. So I just started writing down, this is weird. This is a discrepancy. Like scripture says this, but what I'm seeing is this, my community doesn't reflect this. So I'm like, how does all of this work out? And so uh, that's really what made me start writing. And then it so happened while I was in the Be The Bridge group and I would write some of these things out and people knew that I was from Ethiopia, that one person shared in that Facebook group this article that came out in 2017. The title was Why Western Missionaries Are Needed in Africa. And this man was making a claim that Western missionaries were so needed because Africa was desperate. It's like the spiritually dark place. It's a place where thousands of White lives have been lost for the sake of the gospel. And he even dared to say that Christianity entered Africa in the 19th century. And I was like, what is happening here? So I took that article and I remember because I had so much respect for that space, I wrote them an email. Within a few minutes, I had this 12 reasons why that article was wrong sent it to them, never heard back. I called, never heard back. And I was like, okay, then I'm going to publish it on my blog if nobody's going to respond to me. So I published that article. It became an article. I published it and literally my blog like crashed the next morning. I had so many people contacting me and I was like, "Uh oh, I think I hit a nerve. And so the next day, Nicola from Faithfully Magazine calls me and is like, I want to republish it on my magazine. Are you okay with that? So we edited, got it published. It was voted like one of the top 
articles of that year. It was just a hidden nerve. So that's when I was like, oh, I don't think, and just hearing people's feedback, I was like, I don't think these, like the West, there is a context for Westerners or a framework for Westerners to challenge this. They just eat it up like nothing is wrong. And I was like, no, this is my work. This is what I got to do. And the beautiful part of that was not only Westerners were responding with, oh, I never saw it this way, but diaspora leaders started contacting me and even like leaders from back home all around Africa would reach out and say, thank you for saying this. Like, thank you. This is everything that I want the Western leaders to know before they come to us. And this is like the heartbreak of our church. And this is like the grievances that we have. And I was like, oh my gosh, if that is what is needed, then I just, I'm going to continue read, uh, writing. And so that kind of started the process of me sharing this writing and sharing my thoughts on the Western mission movement. And then when COVID hit, the Lord literally told me, now is the time for you to write. But I was like, I have a baby Lord and I'm working full time. I'm finishing grad school. Like there was so much happening. Oh, you want me to write now? And he's like, yep. So he would literally wake me up at 3 a.m. every day, every single day. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay, I can't fall asleep, so I had to. So that's how it started. What did you find maybe the most enjoyable part of your book to write? And then what were the parts that were challenging for whatever reason? Yeah, I think the easiest to write was, I would say maybe the first six, to six or seven chapters because I was talking about the problem, (laughs) you know, and there was just a lot of problems that needed to be addressed. And I did a lot of research, you know, to support my claims and just make sure that I'm not saying things just because I want to say them. But that was really my favorite part, not only because I was highlighting the problem, but it was a healing process as well. The Lord had given me an opportunity to highlight the issues and then to offer a different perspective. So it was really, really beautiful and exciting. And I was, it was, I honestly, my writing process was a worshipful experience because there were also stories of my own I was telling and stories of friends that I was telling. So it just kind of brought all of that together. And, you know, I would just, sometimes I think about what I just wrote and I'll be like, Lord, I pray that this falls on the, you know, on the right heart. Like, that this message is received and that it is healing. And like, I would just pray over, you know, the things that I'm communicating. As I mentioned, it's not a, an easy, you know, I mean, you've read the book. It's not an easy topic. There are things that kind of could be a punch in the gut for some people. But I really, I'm very, very grateful for that beautiful writing process. Like I knew that this was the way the Lord wanted me to communicate the message and was very open-handed with even the editing process. I was like, you know, Lord, I'm going to take criticism and feedback and pray over it and take the things that I know are going to make the book better. But some of the things I'm just going to leave because I'm not going to change my, you know, my voice, obviously. And so I loved all of that. I think the difficult part was my editor had to challenge me and say, people really like at the end of the day, you're writing for a Western audience and people like some like steps or solutions or like kind of like ABC, like give us something that we can do. And I resisted that so much because again, it's such a Western thing to do, right? Like the whole point of the book is your perspective needs to be challenged. You need to look at things differently. So I was like, I don't want to give them the ABCs of, you know, how to do missions different. It's going to be different for every context. The whole point is follow the Holy Spirit where he leads you and work with the people. Don't like make this an institutionalized thing, you know, has to be individualized. But I did, I ended up doing a little bit of research and just a little bit of more work on how at least I would want people that work in my spaces, you know, in my culture to think about if they're going to choose to go and put together kind of a a little bit of a steps, you know, like one of the chapters that talks about pictures and stuff. I talk about like 
leave your camera at home, hire local photographers, you know, let them tell their story, stuff like that I was able to put in. But that was the most challenging part. I just didn't want to tell people what to do, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 Thanks for sharing that, though. That's like, I appreciate your transparency and describing those moments where, you know, discerning where to push back the things to release. And yeah, I hadn't thought about that before of how, yeah, in our Western cultures, we want like, okay, like you gave me the information. Now I need to know A, B, C, D to of what yeah. to do. I need to know the boxes to check. Exactly. Yeah. We can't just sit after like getting all of this. Like, what do I do? And it's like, just not like sit with it, you know? Right. Yeah. There's so much discomfort of just sitting yes. inside of the problem and thinking about it for a while yeah. before yeah. doing anything. So, yeah, I mean, thank you for challenging us, though, to, mm. to sit in that discomfort. We, mm -hmm. we need to. It's, mm -hmm. it's needed. Yeah. What have been some of the responses that you've gotten to the book? Have there been any, like, really interesting conversations that have come out? I mean, I'm sure there, there have been many, but yeah. are there a few that stand out to you? Yeah. I have recent one, actually. I just was invited to a prayer service that the second generation Ethiopian Christians have, like they have this network nationwide and they get together and pray and encourage one another. And they invited me to come and, you know, speak and pray with them. And they've been reading my book, which is so amazing. But I, it's so exciting because they're young, you know, they're Gen Z's. But after reading the book, they shared with me that they thought they were the ones who had to go and like kind of challenge the status quo. But how much of a gift it's been for them that I've gone and done this work so they can build on it. And literally each person was saying, thank you, like you made our dreams possible. Now we can go further because you've built kind of the stepping stone for us. We can say this is the foundation that we're going to build on to reach the heights that the Lord has called us to. And so that's been such like a life-giving and just beautiful. I still get goosebumps as I'm talking about it because those are, you know, the people that are, I wrote this for my kids. Honestly, I needed my kids to have a framework to see God through not only a Western context, but in all of the beauty of their own culture. And so to be able to present that to my community and for them to say, thank you that you've done this work for us. Now we can go further and higher. Just such a beautiful and exciting feedback to get. And I can't wait to see what the Lord does in and through them. Because as I talk about in the book, they are the Nehemiahs. They are the bridge builders. They are the ones that God is calling to rebuild, you know, the walls of Jerusalem, wherever God calls them. They're the, the warriors of justice. And so to be able to connect with them and is such a beautiful, you know, gift for me. Yeah, that's incredible. That's so mm -hmm. encouraging. This is an amazing book. The content is just so powerful. And mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say is it, mm -hmm. it wasn't just the content that you put in there, it mattered because you were the one who wrote it and, mm -hmm. and your story is just so tied in with that. Mm -hmm. Would you have advice for other authors of color who have something that they want to share similar to this? Like, what would you share as encouragement or motivation for them? Yeah. Thank you. First of all, that's so kind. Yeah, and I'm just so grateful that the Lord allowed me to tell my story through it. I think the encouragement I would give them is honestly, like the Lord uses us. I think a lot of times we talk about us being used as vessels, but I feel like I'm not just a vessel. <laughs> you know, I'm not somebody that's just going to be used to communicate something. I am the beloved of God. And so my story matters, you know, and the way that I see the world matters and the way he has revealed himself to me matters. And so it was really important to me to communicate my journey because I didn't understand these concepts intellectually, like I lived through them. So I didn't want to write just that like an academic 
like intellectual book because it's something that still shapes my life. It's not something I'm doing a research on removed, you know, from my personal experience. And I think especially for a lot of authors of color, a lot of the stuff we talk about is that. And so I would encourage them to explore their story with God and the intimate ways that he's revealed himself to them in the way that they see the world and they challenge the topic that they're talking about and tell their story through it. And I think because I come from a culture, like an oral culture where storytellers I just couldn't imagine writing my first book and not be able to tell my story in it, you know? It's like people need to know who you are and why this matters to you in order for them to kind of be immersed in what you're talking about. So it was really important to tie those together. And I'm so grateful that it came through and that readers are connecting the dots. So yeah, I would say like, you're not just a vessel. You know, you are God's beloved and reflect that in in your writing. I'm sure that will be such an encouragement to a writer of color out there. Is there a final word you'd like to leave for all of our listeners? The only thing I would add is honestly, just the power of the Holy Spirit is something that I lean on and have tried to communicate over and over again throughout the book. And again, not only because we need to reframe Western mission, but because this is a work that was given to believers, but also empowered by the spirit. And I think we separate his power from the work that we're trying to do as Christians, because we lean on the power of money here in the West. And that importance of inviting back the Holy Spirit in our worship, in our churches, in our day-to-day life, being just under his control as we're doing his work is something that is a part of my life really and is a part of my testimony and is something that I want people to wrestle with. Thank you, Mekdes, for sharing your story and your powerful words with us. And now we want to share with our listeners that if you'd like to learn more about Mekdes and her work, you can visit her site at mekdeshadis.com to learn how Mekdes partners with individuals and also helps organizations and churches to reshape the missiology of their outreach. And we want to let you know that you can get your own copy of A Just Mission at ivypress.com and use the code EVN40 to get 40% off plus free U.S. shipping on this book. That's code EVN40. Thanks everyone for listening to the Every Voice Now podcast brought to you by IVP. Our producers and hosts are Paloma Lee and Helen Lee. If you're enjoying our show, we would welcome your reviews and recommendations. You can also support our efforts financially at everyvoicenow.com. And we'd love to hear from you directly anytime. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Every Voice Now. Or visit the site for show notes, transcripts, and more. And join us next time for another inspiring episode.